Welcome back to Gold Derby. I'm Christopher Rosen. I'm joined by Joyce Ng. Joyce, what a week it has been. Uh, we saw West Side Story week. on yes. Monday. And um, Nightmare was it Monday? Alley. Oh, no, you saw him. I saw it Tuesday. I yeah. saw it Monday. You saw it Tuesday. Yeah. And the Nightmare Alley on Wednesday. We're recording this on Thursday. Yes. Uh, it's been a long week. A, a, a very long week. And... But it's also sort of the end of the road ish because Nightmare Alley was was the last big thing. Yeah, it's see. true. At least for yeah. I mean, we'll see. We'll we'll probably see Spider Man, I guess. But I don't think that's going to be. Yeah, a best picture I picture. don't. I mean, I would love to put it in my top ten, but I probably won't. But yeah, so uh, Nightmare Alley and West Side Story, the last two major uh, Oscar contenders, finally screened this week. They just, I felt like. I saw so many people at both of those greetings. I felt, they, and it seems like based on Twitter reactions, everyone has seemingly seen these movies now. They just were like, make sure everybody sees them. And that's it. There's no like- Well, they also had to like get it out for everyone because now December is also Critics Awards. That's right. So. We're recording this on Thursday. New York Film Critics Circle starts their, uh, I guess, kicks things off tomorrow on Friday with their mm-hmm. uh, picks for- for best picture, but Joyce, I want a West Side Story. I I, I want to hear. Tell me what you think. I, I loved it. I was like, I was. Fully you in- are. This is like your new baby. Every 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 week, you have a new movie. You're standing. <laughs> every Chris Tapley, who uh, used to do award stuff, he tweeted. I saw that he had like. He was like Oscar pundits after every movie, and I was like mm-hmm. Oprah Winfrey being like, "And you get a car, and you, you get know, a car." The and recency like, bias is real. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I feel seen. That being said, and I know I've said multiple times on this so every week, I'm like, oh, I love that movie. Really love West Side Story. I was I was extremely excited by it. Uh, it was great. I, I was I was very I was very into it. What did you think? I I enjoyed it as well. Um, probably not as much as you did, but it it is a very good movie, very well made. Um, it's probably one of like Spielberg's like best made movies in a while um i mean i really like bridge of spies <laughs> bridge of spies is great yeah i think because of the spectacle of this i like this more but it's yeah. definitely he's, he's like it's also kind of nice because he's talked so long about like wanting to direct the musical and like you know this was his dream come true basically and he finally did it and he did a really good job and this you know this is like a beloved classic um an oscar-winning best picture from 60 years ago when it won 10 out of 11 categories. Uh, So there's like, you know, a lot of pressure and he delivered and he, you know, I haven't, I, I'm not, you know, like a huge like musical person. I I haven't seen the original film in the decades, like probably since like the late nineties, really. (laughs) um, So I, I have very like faint memory of the the original film but i i know like that you know they changed some things and reassigned you know some songs um but uh it it's it's like a a refreshing update i would say yeah uh, one of the things i laughed at when we went in is on the on the ticket i don't know if you had this on yours it was like the had like the review embargo which was oh uh, yeah yeah, yeah. Like, and then it was like don't don't spoil <laughs> anything and it's like the movie's 60 years old and then after watching it, i was like well there are some things I think that you would be you would count as spoilers. I mean, like like plot wise, plot wise, no. there's nothing to spoil because no. it's also an adaptation of Romeo and Juliet. So yeah. uh, Tony <laughs> still still dies in this version. Yeah. Uh, he does not go. And there's no change on any anything that happens uh, with regard to that. And that's the, I'm not. There's no spoiler alert for that. I'm sorry. It's when yeah. if if you're not familiar with this, like just please leave. <laughs> like, yeah. Um. But no, I I was like so I had actually so I. I've watched it twice in the last year. We watched it like last year and then I watched it recently because I was like, oh, I want to rewatch it before I see it. And so having that context for me, you there are a lot of small tweaks and changes that the Tony Kushner script makes and that Spielberg made that go beyond just like the obvious of like casting like, you know, uh, Latina uh, actors in these roles instead of uh, Natalie Wood playing Maria, which is like good. Uh, so, but like, yeah, there's a lot of small changes and, I, one of the things I really appreciated in the second watching it after rewatching the original is that there's not a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of like context or explanation about like any of the relationships really. It does. The original is just like, you'll figure it out. And there is value to that, but I appreciated that this version was like, went a little deeper into like Tony and Riff's relationship 
uh, went like a little further onto like the Jets and the Sharks and like what they're actually fighting over and like the context of the city and all those things. I, I was, I was greatly impressed. I, I don't know. I mean, like, it's a couple of things. You're right. It's like a gorgeous looking movie. I feel like it could get like a ton, certainly in the conversation for most nominations, I would predict maybe, you know, in there. I, I, right now I'd say like oh. Dune and maybe Nightmare Alley we could talk about later and like West Side Story potentially have like a potential for double digits, let's say. Um, so that was like good. And then, I don't know, I think like we've been talking about like Power of the Dog is like the best picture front runner. I think we both still have it in there at, at first. I did not switch to anything else. I, I doubt, I don't think you did either. It seems like yeah. the critical consensus and like a movie that like everyone can agree on. But I am now after West Side Story. And I know I said this recently about like, don't look, I'm like, maybe like, it's definitely a crowd pleaser. It's definitely a movie that people will love watching. And maybe this is like the avatar to Power of the Dogs Hurt Locker, which doesn't mean it'll win. But I mean, maybe that's like the two movies that will be competing uh, most of all at the Oscars for Best Picture. Yeah, I mean, I think I moved it into second or third. I don't remember what I did. I updated everything this morning. <laughs> I don't remember what I we did. We saw so much. You had to. I know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I don't, I don't think it necessarily like needs to win because it's a crowd pleaser, but right. th this does feel like something that most people really like um, and enjoy and feel passionate about, which I don't know if you can say about a lot of, or several of like the other contenders. It's like they're, um, you know, like admired and respected, but yeah, like I, I, and I think, you know, similar to like being the Ricardos in a way, not that I, I think like that will like win best picture, but there was kind of like an underestimation of this. It's like, oh, he's like redoing West Side Story. Like, is it really going to be better? Like a lot of people love the first film, you know, even though they're, you know, in, in hindsight, there's, you know, some problems with it. <laughs> but, you know, that was a, a film of its era. So, um, and, you know, he delivered. So I think that when you exceed people's expectations like that, I think, um, it's, it's easier to be kind of like in that conversation of, oh, it could win, but it's still like December 2nd. So. Yeah. I, I don't want to say it's going to win. I, I, I couldn't go that far, but I think you're a hundred. I, lo I love that. You're saying that I, I totally agree. I was watching it. It was definitely one of those movies where you could just feel people being like, I totally underestimated why, why we all thought this or uh, I'll speak. Yeah. Like remember when it was announced, it's like, why? are they reteaming this is the third movie together Kushner and Spielberg like why are they reteaming to do West Side Story right and it just felt like you know why we underestimated it sure I, I, like why would I doubt Steven Spielberg I guess is a question I'll be asking myself but I was like not that I wasn't looking forward to it but I definitely went in thinking like why are we doing this and then watching it you're just like oh this is why and it's incredible and it's staged really well I would say one thing I think that West Side Story has is uh, a great it got potential to have, what do you, what would you say, Joyce, from an acting standpoint, above the line, if we have picture and, and director, I put Spielberg back in for, I put him in for director also. because I, I did think, too. I think it's like going to be, it's his first musical and you'd be hard pressed to watch it and not come away with the idea that he should be directing. He should have maybe done another one at some point because he's like really he, good at it. it it's, it's kind of like he should be, he, sh he should have been directing musicals this whole time. Yeah. Like what took him so long? <laughs> yeah, it's just the energy and the way he stages the numbers are, are really awesome. Um, but yeah, I was also blown away by the performances. So watching it, I was I was most impressed. I think we both were with uh, Mike Feist, who uh, plays Riff. Would you say Feist I or think Feist? It's Mike Feist. Yes. Mike Feist. Mike Feist. Another name um, I'll say wrong three billion times between now and March. Well, as I as I like told my friend, I was like, he was the best part of the movie. And then he was like, how do you pronounce his name? And I said, oh, like Heist. And he's like, oh, like time heist. I was like, yes, time heist. Nailed it. Exactly. I know. This is our second Marvel reference already. So, but um, <laughs> yeah, no, he was amazing as Riff. And honestly, you know, that category is all over the place supporting actor. I would mm -hmm. completely support him sweeping and winning it all. Like, I can, I, it's I like can see it would, happening. Yeah. Like the, I mean, like Riff dies. 
we know this. This yes, is yes. not a spoiler. No. But no. I did not want him to die. <laughs> like, because I knew he would be gone for the rest of the movie. And I, and I just knew like the energy of the movie would be so different. I mean, obviously it would be different after the rumble anyway, but like, he, like every time he was on screen, it was electric and he, and I feel like such a local talking about him. Like I, I knew going in, he was, you know, a Tony nominated Broadway star for Dear Evan Hansen, but I'd never seen him in anything. Um, and he was great. And he also looks like he belongs in the fifties. Like, <laughs> that face <laughs> it's it really incredible uh that's one of the you know with regard to the whole project i think like when you're like the, the casting is so important because rather than like go like you could imagine a version of this where it's like every role is filled with like an a-list star right like just like regardless of broad uh, singing talent be like oh we can figure out how to make him sing and the dancing will cut around and this because he's got mike feist as uh, Riff and Ariana DeBose, who plays Anita, and you know, like just Car- like uh, David Alvarez plays uh, Bernardo. These are like Broadway performers who are incredibly talented, and that like opens up the whole movie because then you don't have to cut around their dancing. Like you're watching them do this stuff. There's like um, Riff is uh, Mike Vice says is great. Just there's so many great scenes, but he's in he's part of Be Cool, which in the I think. It's a little confusing because I've never actually seen the stage version, but I've seen the movie, obviously. In the movie, that's not done by Rick. Yeah, it's. I think that's a- after he after dies. After he right? dies. Yeah. And so I guess this, but in the musical, in the stage musical, based on at least the profile of Tony Kushner that I read in the Times, it sounds like that this, in the musical, Riff does do it because I think he like reordered it based on like the original musical. And so like you get Riff doing Be Cool. Uh please tell me if I'm wrong about all this. But anyway, in the movie, this version, he does be cool and it's awesome. And it's just is like, oh my gosh, he's so good. And he's dan- and there's like a very elaborate dancing going on during that. Um, and that's one of the scenes actually where we haven't, you've met Ansel Elgort is uh, Tony, uh, not a Broadway star, but he actually acquits himself pretty well as big as a dancer, I would say. He's actually a solid I, w- I would actually say I was more impressed by his singing and dancing than um, his actual like acting performance. performance. Yeah, he's um, quite, quite good at both. Yeah. Um, and you know yeah. those songs are hard to sing and i feel like a lot of people like the the snippets that have been released of songs people are like coming for him for his singing because obviously like rachel zegler is amazing but i yeah like he acquits himself well with those songs they're they're sondheim songs not easy right. to sing no um so yeah so mike vice i agree i would i i don't i don't know if he's in the prediction center just yet but i will definitely move him in when uh we we have him at it i think we, we need to make him happen this is a like vice stan account now <laughs> you know, it's funny is uh, when you watch the original rust hamblin obviously famously played riff and it's like i forgot it's like a huge riff is a humongous part he's like a huge part of the opening and basically the first two-thirds of the movie and so like it's like he definitely in this movie he just pops off the screen. Rust Hamlin, obviously a classic performance too. I think people really like love his performance. I saw that Amber Tamblin, uh, who is Rust Hamlin's daughter and a famous actress, uh, went with Rust to see the uh, this and she new had version. an amazing um, Rough U shirt. shirt, yeah, yeah. custom yeah. shirt, yeah, really cool. <laughs> um, so Mike Feist in, and then uh, so one not a surprise necessarily was. Uh, we talked, I think we talked about her when we talked about supporting actors, Ariana DeBose playing Anita, obviously won Rita Moreno and Oscar uh, 60 years ago. So I mean, people were expecting that performance to be good because the character is so good. And you obviously get like so many showcase scenes when you play Anita. She's awesome in the movie. Absolutely incredible. I thought like blows, like, explodes off the screen, does yeah. everything you want. Really good. Maybe a surprise, certainly for me, I don't know about you, is that Rita Moreno is like in it a lot. And left the movie uh, with a lot of people singing her praises as a potential nominee and also mo- maybe even a winner who which would make her like the oldest winner ever. And obviously just- Yeah, so- oldest nominee. She's going to be 90 next week, uh, the day after this opens in theaters. So like legend, legendary behavior, really. Yeah. Um, and yeah, no, like I, I felt the same way about Ariana. Um, I mean, yeah, like we talked about like she could get it just because like that that role is so baby and she has America and everything. And then, you know, like just her like final scene, like devastating, like the way that was also staged. Um, but yeah, like Rita, I guess, I guess, you know, when when she was like announced as like coming on board as like a reimagined version of Doc, like she's she's Valentina Doc's widow in the movie um 
so I think like maybe people thought like she'd just be more of like a cameo or something but she does have like several like good scenes and then she she gets to sing uh they they give her somewhere to sing um instead of having Tony and Maria sing it yes so that that's like her her big like emotional moment at the end as well so I you know that that category I think is like there's a lot of um contenders but I I, you know, we've talked about this before. Like, it feels like the top three is probably Katrina, Kirsten, and Anjanou. And then it's like those other two slots. So maybe, like, I put them both in for now. I also put them <laughs> both in. I, I also I, didn't want to, like, think about it too much. So I was like, I'll just put them in for now. I, I I feel like I could definitely see both of them getting in. And if one of them doesn't, I think it would maybe be Ariana only because like Rita Moreno is like Rita Moreno, but I think Ariana is like incredibly good. And you can make an argument that she could actually end up being like a front runner to win. If not for Rita Moreno, I don't know. I mean, I have them both in, I could see them like, I guess we'll start seeing like, but all the reviews have like praised Rita. And I think the narrative, the story, like it's weird. It's like the story of that would be so great for the Oscars and I'm almost like I know like you know like imagine like not only does she win or get nominated but then if she ever won just like she no other uh Hispanic actress has ever or actor has ever won an Oscar right so you and, have yeah and then like literally six years later for the <laughs> same title the role. not yeah. the same role but like, like <laughs> I don't I also remember when she presented like what like, like three years ago she wore mm-hmm. her dress the same dress just incredible. And I mean, obviously, like no one, few have as much goodwill as, as Rita Moreno. In the, yeah, I will. I will say, remember, like last year, like all the the narrative around like Ellen Burstyn possibly being like the oldest right. acting nominee um, and also like Sophia Loren possibly coming back like two like legends like Rita and like they didn't happen. But Rita has a stronger film, like their films right. are not strong. Yeah, you can make the case where West Side Story ends up with like 10 nominations pretty easily. And like, then does Rita get in? I I don't know. It'd be very interesting. Like we said, well, Best Supporting Actress is like just wild. And so is Best Supporting Actor. So I could, I think there's a lot of room there for them. And then you mentioned Rachel Zegler. I'll be honest, I recently bias, I put her in for like 30 seconds (laughs) and I think Best Actress. I think she's a contender for sure. She's incredibly good in the movie, I thought. She's got a great voice. And I think she really, you know, Natalie Wood played that role uh, in the original, uh, famously not a uh, not is is a white actress, so not a not a not playing a, not not a, a Puerto Rican as Maria is in the film. Um, and you know, I, I mean, she also didn't do her own singing, so and she's also much older than Rachel Ziegler. I thought like having a, a age appropriate Maria who is uh, doing her own singing was really important for the story. It, it made it feel like a lot more tragic at times, and like she just does so. It's just really good in it. And I, I was like very impressed. Yeah. Again, like best her, actress her is like impossible. And but. her eyes are really expressive. Yeah. So and like Spielberg does that like Spielberg face thing. Right? Yeah. Right, right? Like, um, so yeah, that's West, West Side. So Joy, yeah, the only, no original song. They didn't add like a throw in a freebie song to get a nomination. Just like fully old school. I, you know, I don't know. There's, I, I, I was trying to count it up in my head. I was like cinematography, costumes, maybe production design adapted screenplay picture director sound. That's six sound would be seven and then like three acting nominees that gets you to 10 right there i mean i mean listen the original only had two acting nominations right <laughs> so i don't know we'll see uh yeah we didn't mention david alvarez he plays bernardo uh, george shakaris won uh, oscar for playing bernardo i really love bernardo in i love david alvarez's performance and i thought bernardo was actually the way they reconceive that character slightly, I thought was like really cool. But mm-hmm. I think the problem is that because Riff and Mike Face the Feist is so uh, just so good, it almost makes it seem like harder for David Alvarez to get traction. Because if you're looking at the supporting actors, you're going to be like, man. That- what if what if they're the ones who are going to pull, or West Side Story is the one that's going to pull the supporting double double and not Belfast? It really could. <laughs> I mean, you know, I I I would not be. It would not be upsetting to me. He's so like David Alvarez is really 
charming and like super compelling. Yeah, like I, I also didn't want him to die. Like, no, they're... you really like him. It was like a bummer when that scene comes. It's like, oh man, these guys. It's like you know, it's, you know, it's coming, and then it's just like, oh. Oh, Joyce. So, yeah, so that's uh, so that's West Side Story. The reviews were out on um, today, which is Thursday, and everyone a lot of uh, strong reviews. I think it had a very high Metacritic score. Yeah, when I looked this morning, yeah. I think it was at like eighty-seven on Metacritic and like ninety-four in Rotten Tomatoes. So that bodes well for. I mean, obviously, I I, I think. Well, well, I'm not re- ready to say what if it would win, and I haven't moved it in front. I would be actually stunned if it doesn't get nominated for best picture especially with 10 nominees like it just seems like unheard of the way the response was and yeah i don't know i guess we'll see so now yeah, we can I move think, on. i yeah. think it's like top five i think it's top five also yeah. yeah i don't know how much like you know box office wise i don't really care you know but i don't know how well it'll do but i i think it, this is like a movie like the people who matter aka the voters <laughs> will like yes so. i was also wondering i was talking about this with friends the other day like i have no idea how much money it could make at the bottom it doesn't matter right, whatever yeah, i was like, like yeah i have no i have no idea i couldn't even couldn't even hazard a guess you could tell me it makes like 50 million or, or 10 million i'd be like okay like you know nothing, may, nothing like me. like maybe it'll be like box office queen lady gaga i don't know Right. Well, that's the thing. I was like, how's yeah. Gucci got 20 million with Lady Gaga, <laughs> the queen, uh, helping uh, drive it along. So, so that was on Mon- Monday for me and Tuesday for you. And then last night we both saw uh, Wednesday night, Nightmare Alley up at Alice Tully Hall. Uh, the world the, the premiere. Big, the big premiere. Big premiere. I, I had a uh, I had Quest Love sitting a few row, a few seats down for me, name dropper. You, you saw everybody, and I and saw then, nobody. <laughs> and then I saw our pal Jeremy Strong from Succession with Nicholas Braun. They were together at the event. And he did, he didn't friends, burn him. He didn't burn him. He brought him and said, "Yeah." And one of my friends said he saw Cherry Jones there, which means we were so close to a Turnhaven reunion. Oh my choice. god! Yes. And I'm sure we'll talk I, about Succession later. But I, just I know, tell you but you know, it's fitting. Not a spoiler. There's a rabbit in the movie. So yes. Uh, so yeah, so Nightmare Alley, another highly, like a very anticipated uh, drama Guillermo del Toro's follow-up to Shape of Water. Obviously that won Best Picture and Best Director in uh, 2017, it came out, so 2018 Oscars, right? Um, what you think, Joyce? What do you, what do you, what, what were your big top line takeaways for Nightmare Alley? Um, it's, it's a very, very pretty film, like yes, all yeah. of GDT's films. Um, I put it in first for production design. <laughs> like, those, like, Kate Blanchett's office, man, wow. Um, Amazing. Very pretty cinematography, great. Like all the texts are like pureless, really. Um, and Alexander Dupla did not score. Nathan Johnson, who did Knives Out, scored it instead. I think it was like a, a scheduling conflict, but the score is really good as well. Yep. Um, I, agree. I found it to be long um and you know how i feel about long movies but this yes, one yeah. this like house of gucci i felt it yes and, you definitely feel it yeah yeah and unlike house of gucci where i felt it at the end because it's like the third act drag and like gaga's gone for like a, a lot of it this you feel at the beginning mm-hmm. which i think it's rougher and it's just it's just like a lot of like set up and so I, I've never read the book or seen the 47 version, but like everything I've read about like the the title in general is that like things really start when Kate Blanchett sh- shows up. Yes. And this movie is like, like a real slow burn that never really fully ignites. And like Kate brings some spark. I'm gonna completely run this fire metaphor into the ground now. But like she, yeah, like she, she brings some spark to it because then you get like the actual plot going and it it fuels this like late third act fire and a lot happens in like what, 20 minutes at the end? It does feel like a ton. It it, it really speeds through a lot of like, oh my God moments towards the yeah, end. Yeah, like it gets like really exciting at the end, but then it gets like extinguished and then the film is over. <laughs> right. So uh, yeah, I, I would totally agree. I, I agree with you. I think like, truly peerless uh, production everything like if it reminded me a little bit of dune on that front where it was just like every department is just like firing on all cylinders where you're just mm-hmm. like oh my god the score rules the sound rules the costumes are amazing the production design the cinematography hair makeup like down the line and i really think it could like like i also moved it to top in production design it seems like 
just incredible stuff. I could really see it uh, winning, right? Like no problem with that, even though that seems like it'll be a deep category uh, as, as well. Uh, and yeah, it was one of the, I forget who's, I think, I forget who said it, but somebody was like, Shape of Water was a lot more, uh, it weirdly more accessible, even though it was about uh, a man, a, a woman having sex with a fish monster. It just had like a little more of a warmer heart. I mean, this story is not a, not a warm and cuddly story. No, uh, it's, it's pretty, pretty dark. Bleak, which, which is yeah. fine, but I yeah. think it like cohesively, it, it doesn't quite come together or it takes too long to get there. Yeah. You have a, uh, you mentioned Kate Blanchett. I, 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 I loved her when she comes in, she's great. And like, I think a lot of the reviews were like, uh, or reviews and responses seemingly at this point, I just cracked you up. I'm like, everybody reviews everything. They're like, it's a review embargo, but you can still tweet about it. And then I know it's, it's like reviews. a tweet view. Yeah. Sure. Whatever. <laughs> Everyone but, uh, has Blanchett, it scheduled for the embargo time. <laughs> exactly. But, uh, Kate Blanchett was a top line. I feel like a uh, headline about it. Like everybody loved her in it. She really is like, kind of a perfect in the role and like I don't know I think she's probably the best shot as a, at a nomination for supporting actress we had talked about how they are decided to run her in supporting and Rooney Mara in lead I mean and at the time we're like that just clears room for Kate in supporting and now having seen it I would say that does though I think Rooney Mara is actually really solid in it she's not she doesn't have a large role for a lead performance at least no, she's she's like a borderline. Like if, if they had yeah. decided to run all the women in supporting, yeah. I would have been like, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Um, so she definitely I, has like the the second most screen time after Bradley. That's true. Uh, and Bradley obviously is is great. We had t- you t- we were texting briefly last night. We got home so late. It was just it was a long evening. I got uh, home at midnight. <laughs> but we were texting about it. And uh, yeah, Bradley's Cooper's uh, last scene. He's good in the whole thing. And then the last scene is just like, really really good and i think people leave the movie just like incredibly impressed with the performance i I don't i didn't move him in i haven't had him in for best actor i know he's been like a popular like fifth six pick seemingly in our combined odds Mm -hmm. um but i could see people like being really wowed by him a lot of the tweets were like oh this is his this is going to be his eighth nomination or whatever you know overall or you know maybe he could win I still think if he's going to win it for anything, it would be licorice pizza this year. But, uh, and I don't think this performance only helps that performance. I think get him in as a supporting actor, but yeah, he's also really good. And then the ensemble is actually awesome. I really loved uh, David Strathairn, uh, who is in it in the beginning part. And Willem Dafoe has a more of a smaller role in the beginning. And even like in like really small part, like Mary Steenburgen has like two scenes. Oh my God, like MVP, truly. So good. <laughs> and uh, Tim Blake Nelson has like one scene the, towards the end that's great. And uh, Richard Jenkins playing kind of against type and against like what he did in, in Shape of Water. Tony Collette, I found really great. Ron Perlman is in it. Um, it's like a pretty solid ensemble of like very well-liked actors. Clifton Collins shows up for like two scenes. So yeah, I could see it. I mean, I think it'll be a, a player. I I don't know. I mean, who knows? But we'll see. I, I could see it being like a uh, underdog contender for like an ensemble nomination from SAG, maybe, or you know, a best picture, like a lower end best picture nominee. But I think the craft stuff is going to be pretty wild. I, like I do think it could get upwards of ten nominations. Though I don't know if Del Toro could squeeze into director because I just feel like with Spielberg having like drop West Side Story and then Campion and then PTA and Denny for Dune, Kenneth Branagh and on and on. It's getting crowded. So I don't know about him getting in. Yeah. And I think like with, with the, the mixed reception, um, I think it's, it's, it's also like a genre film, you know, like. Right. Yeah. It's funny. It's not about, uh, he made a point before the, the movie he Guillermo del Toro spoke a little bit and he was like oh I want to he didn't this is first movie without monsters but real the real monsters are are men uh Joyce I don't know if you yeah you got that from the movie I, I heard I heard yeah <laughs> um yeah I, I had not seen the original either I was talking to my friends who saw it he actually just watched it and he said like oh there actually there's some changes like the original has more of a a studio mandated happy ending it seems this one ends on a pretty dark note which I preferred based on what I read about the original ending, even though I haven't seen uh, the original. So bad job out of me. Um, but yeah, it sounds like a lot of, like, it's very, if you've seen the original, like a lot of the beats will be familiar. Um, but I think some of it is like remixed sort of like West Side Story style with uh, the Spielberg. Yeah, Spielberg I think, film. I think with it, I think 
you know, a, a lot of people, I, you know, just like anecdotally found it long. Um, mm-hmm. It's like, it's like two and a half, right? Yeah. Like it was actually, I think it's 140 minutes maybe. Okay. Um, yeah. And I don't, I don't know, so I, I could see like some people not getting too into it or just, you know, or maybe like, they're just like looking for like, like the Cape Blanchett part, like act two. And like when that starts up, cause that really like gets things rolling. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I would say if it makes it into best picture, it would, it would probably be like lower tier, like maybe ninth or 10th. I mm-hmm. uh, also don't have them in director. And I, I think like Kate, it's, is its best chance for above the line. Um, and I actually took her out for, for West Side Story, ladies. Um, it's true. I had her in too. And then I was like, oh, Rita Moreno. I, I like, I, I really, like Kate is great. And she, she really does like, like light up like the film and like, you know, like thing, things happen because of her character. And she has some great scenes with Bradley Cooper, but I also feel like she could like do this character in her sleep and she has before (laughs) (laughs) well it's an interesting run because she's got this and also uh don't look up where she plays like a a bubbly morning show host they're not very similar parts but i wonder i guess the funny thing was i was i don't know i was she was in don't look up a lot more than i thought and she's not as in this less but because she doesn't come in to until like the second hour it does feel like she's not in it you know what i mean like i was like oh she's in this less than i thought it would be and she's in don't look up more than i thought she would be and i wonder if that'll like also like like maybe split her vote a little more than i expected right because i think people will be taken with her don't look up performance but she's also not probably getting in for that either i don't know yeah i don't know it's it's like interesting because like if if you like subscribe to the notion that like like the general public won't like respond to Nightmare Alley then like fewer people will watch this than you know supposedly don't look up on Netflix with this also an all-star cast but like even more people and it's more accessible in that everyone can watch it right like around the world you know right so it'll be more seen yeah Um, but she's also you know she has competition with like Meryl from that film yes (laughs) who I also consider putting in (laughs) <laughs> it's true I, it's like this is a just a wild we were I was thinking about this and it's just like it's so silly because like earlier we we're saying like every week I'm like oh this movie is good but and also like Listen, the cliche, there's, there's nothing else to see really so <laughs> but also and also the cliche that like oh they all the good movies come out at the end of the year and this year I was like oh no like a lot of good ones came out at like Telluride and like you know we've seen them but I was like actually like the last few big movies are all like really like none of them are outright none of them are like an outright flop there's no like extremely loud incredibly close no offense to that uh by i mean that was still a best picture nominee and it still was a best picture nominee (laughs) but it wasn't good and i was like none of these are are on that level where it's like a huge expectation and then a big disappointment yeah um and i think that's like the biggest surprise i think this year has ended up being like incredibly strong like we had talked recently about how boy how how are you gonna feel out 10 nominees and now i'm like oh you know what this is like i'd actually think there'll be like a few really good or well-reviewed movies that don't even get in even with 10 nominees like I think this is a good year for a 10 because there are actually probably 13 or 14 legitimate contenders for best picture nomination so and that's kind of exciting as much as silly as it is to sit here every week and be like oh this movie's great and also to read every tweet every night be like Actually, this is the front runner. No, you know what? This guy's going to win best. We're going to have 12 best actor winners, including Bradley Cooper. And, uh, you know, it's just, just like getting Every, everyone is going to get nominated. OK, it's everyone gets nominated. This yeah. is a I'm waiting for the hot take of we should expand all the nominations to 10. I got to imagine that comes soon. Everyone gives their career best performance. In- Everyone's never been better. And yeah. if we had 10 nominees, it would be absolutely perfect. Um Joyce, we're recording this on Thursday. So we're waiting for the MBR uh, to announce their uh, award. So we'll, we'll, I guess we'll talk more about that like at a later date because they haven't done it yet and whatever. Um, and then we have New York Film Critics tomorrow, which we briefly touched on this week in a, in a, a special uh, after school special column of mm-hmm. uh, Oscar ex- experts typing, which is great. Be curious to see what they do here. In that column, we both stumped for uh, Ben Affleck re- resurrection for uh 
last duel in tender bar i feel like i saw the tender bar like seven years ago <laughs> yeah it came out i think it was like a 2012 movie but uh, i'm really excited that yeah the same so yeah totally for, for oscars so before we wrap up joyce let's do our we talked about jeremy strong and uh nick braun but i, I want to get their takes on nightmare alley i was thinking the same thing i was like you know what jeremy probably was like super into because he's super method and i bet you he was like very impressed with bradley's performance that's what that was my thought yeah um, but wow, that last episode of Succession was possibly the best one of the season. What would it, you say? I mean, yes. And also like a perfect, if tapes still matter, like a perfect tape for Jeremy for the Emmys. But did, did you watch the episode of eight screener? No, no, I have not yet. I watched it. Obviously. Oh boy. <laughs> and, and, uh, so, good. <laughs> so a couple of things we want to talk about that episode. A, um, Again, I, I just feel like people watch that show. Not They don't watch it wrong, but I think it's very funny like watching how people desperately want to root for these characters. I've fallen prey to this too, because I always said like, oh, Jeremy's performance is so good. You kind of want Kendall to succeed. This season has done a great job of like just tearing Kendall down both emotionally and like you feel really at the end of this last episode, which was his birthday, his 40th birthday, he seems at his lowest point, which is shocking because multiple times this season, it felt like he was at his lowest point. And now it's like, no, this I mean, multiple times in the series, he's been at his lowest point. <laughs> and then, um, but yeah, like you have like, I, I know there's been a lot of like, we've, we love uh, uh, Kieran Culkin as, as Roman, despicable behavior in this episode, uh, just really beyond the pale um, to-, Listen, to- he's, he's like on the high that like Kendall was at the beginning of the season yes. after his like, press conference and like he's like feeling it he got a scars for a monday meeting he got him to pee on the stargo app okay <laughs> like- so good um yeah roman really really taking a turn and really trying to like end up uh as his dad's number one boy i would say like an in- I, one of the things i love about uh, television and, and i've seen like people complaining about like this one of the not- things i love about television <laughs> one of the things that one thing i love about television choice now i've seen people complaining about how like the show is like spinning its wheels and like i've seen people i i don't it. think so at all i've seen that as well and i it's do a, that it's agree. a great bad take bad take yeah uh, wrong bad take. tweet bad tweet <laughs> bad tweet uh but the reason i don't think it is like that is because you actually seen roman has grown so much and like while his behavior towards uh kendall and shiv was especially despicable like he's become like quite a savvy business operator and like if you think back to like how he was even at the start of season two he was a joke like no one took him seriously he had to go to training he went to training he's been under jerry's tutelage uh seemingly and like he's just learned and he's like trust he's got maybe the best instincts out of any of the roy kids like he knows like when a deal is bad and he kind of like knows when to walk away and push and he definitely has that killer instinct that Logan said Kendall didn't. Um, whether or not the Ace Cars deal ends up like spinning out of his control, I think we'll see. You've seen ahead, so you don't have to say. But I was like, I do wonder if that like will end up blowing up in his face lately because like, I mean, like, he was very confident. Yeah. About it. Like I've, I've said, was it last week, two weeks ago? I don't know, a month ago. I've always felt that Roman was the smartest sibling, even and though I, he's like the true. most immature um because people tend to think of like Shiv as the smartest one and like she's smart but I don't think she's the smartest and we've talked about this before and how she like flails when things go wrong um but yeah no like Roman has been killing it with like Jared Menken and uh Lucas Matson back to back yeah and yeah like he I like I don't I don't think he realizes like how I like I think he cares about his siblings and like he does just kind of want to like go back to like that like bickering they used to do instead of just like fighting for like the job and I like I think because like you know he like they're all like so emotionally stunted he doesn't realize how much like he's actually hurting them when he like shoves his brother to the floor you know right like to them like it's still kind of like a joke because like he's still like internally like emotionally a child but he is like very business savvy and smart and yeah they'll they'll be um more development the ace cars is in the eighth episode he you is, get okay. you get the the crying scene but from a different angle than was in the trailer interesting yeah i, w- I would love to go back after the season i think we could uh zabruder film the the trailer 
uh, because and, like, so what was scenes, not included. <laughs> so much was not included. Like I'm like, a, we could do that to the Don't Look Up trailer too. <laughs> truly, there's so much that's not in it. I, somebody was, I was listening to uh, another podcast and they were like talking about it. I forget which one, but they were like, oh, like uh, there's a scene of like Kendall with the kids where they're like a little upset. And that doesn't seem like it's in this in these last the, the two. kids uh, are in the flesh in the eighth episode so like eight eight and nine okay. are in italy for okay. caroline's wedding obviously right. we know right. that already so yeah so he brings the kids to italy okay. so you see the you see sophia and iverson in eight finally instead yeah, of finally. on an ipad um, yeah yeah roman not, not the, the rabbit thing, though <laughs> the rabbit's got to be dead uh well, the other <laughs> thing with roman i would say is that like and again this is why i'm like the show is gonna like Shiv this season has made every bad choice and wrong decision and totally thinks she's like the smartest person and is so, so dumb sometimes. And then she couldn't even act happy when Tom wasn't going to jail. Correct. And like <laughs> one of the things I think you've seen, we they've slowly done. And one of a thing they I love about the show is they're just very subtle. Like they just drop it in. Like she does not take Roman seriously. She never has. And like, so yeah, he does have a chip on his shoulder towards her. And like, that's why he is so gleeful uh, to trash her when he gets all his deals done and like yeah, his dad's and, and like Logan included him in the buyout for Kendall sure. and not Shiv. And like, sure. obviously that, that sticks in her craw as, as it would. Yeah. So, so we yeah. didn't even, and then we didn't talk about uh, Tom and uh, uh, Greg, a great, great Tom and Greg stuff. Uh, Tom now not going to prison choice, maybe. But such an amazing arc just in Greg's office. And then in Greg's office, it flips the desk over. Uh, it's just incredible scene. Uh, so good. I loved it so much. And Greg's reaction to that was awesome. And then you had Greg with Comfrey at the party, just an all-time Greg scene where he's doing like a Southern accent for no reason. It's just so weird. <laughs> it's like so, so good. I don't even, I don't know what was happening there. And then I love like, the best part was like after like Kendall tells him like no you can't ask her out and then he goes over to like large screen of him and he just like lightly taps <laughs> tapping the LCD screen or LED see that's what I like I love about show because it like subverts like all your expectations of it and I think this is also why some people feel like it's just spinning its axis and like doing the same thing this season because I feel like after the season two finale people expected this like huge showdown between like right. Kendall and Logan like maybe like like the investigation like flares up they go to court and like all this stuff and that hasn't happened and I like it that way like it's it's not about like the mechanics of like the business like I don't understand like half the stuff they talk about half like shareholders like what I don't know like I just know that like you know Stewie and the Sandys like you know like they could have like taken control of like it went to a vote you know and but like that's not what's important to the show like it's the relationships and like those right. dynamics are reported. And like, there's been so many developments to the season about that. And I think people just kind of wanted that like all out war for the company this season. Yeah. And like, they basically kind of like, you know, it's it's kind of over like with like in the, the in the beginning of this episode when they're just like, oh, like I heard from like, you know, Jerry's like I heard from the OJ, like we'll probably just like have to pay a settlement. That's it, you know? Pretty great. I, I love that too. I was like, oh, uh... I just kind of love that they, I love when they like shows do that and it's just like brushed away one thing. Cause it feels also real because like they probably wouldn't face any kind of repercussions. Yeah. Or, the raisin is still in office. Right. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that was uh, a lot of, a lot of fun. Now, Joyce, one thing I want to ask you before we go, well, I saw Jay Cameron Smith was giving an interview and she said the ending is like uh, a shocking, shocking. Yeah. and heartbreaking, right. Or something like that. But it, it, she said uh, something along those lines. Yeah. So I, so I, um, what's your theory? I don't know. I, I think a lot of people's theory is that like a death is involved. Yes, I agree. So who do you think would die? I, I mean, I guess like, like the most obvious answer would be Logan. And also you, you have, you know, Ace Gars asking like, when is Logan dying? Like just flat out there, you know? Right. <laughs> um, but I, it could also be like someone like minor. I don't think, I think if they would kill someone, I don't think they would go like super minor and irrelevant. I don't either. And I don't think they would, I just have a hard time believing they're going to kill any of these key people in the family. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, I don't think you could go. I mean, I've seen people like speculate is Kendall is Jeremy strong is like won an Emmy. He could win another Emmy this year. He's done everything. So I, I will say in the eighth episode, it's um, it features the scene that Brian Cox has talked about in all like yes. the preseason interviews of like uh, a one-on-one -on -one between like Kendall and Logan that like ended 
uh, with like Jeremy crying when they were done. <laughs> so. so that's it. Can't wait for that. Uh, so I, I'm like, I don't know if you kill Kendall off, I think you end up like it just unmoors the show in a way that would really surprise me. I think Brian Cox, they talked about, they would have wanted to kill him off in the first season, Logan. And uh, then they realized the drama. I mean, he was Logan. like in a hospital bed from what, like, like two, three episodes. <laughs> right. And it's like, the drama is that Logan is there and that like all these kids are vying for his affection and his approval. And he just is like, no, I'm not doing that. And also I can change the rules whenever I want and you all have to jump and follow with me. So it feels like taking him off the board would be weird. Roman and Shiv, I don't think you could do because can you imagine succession without Kieran Culkin and uh, like um, Sarah Snook? I can't, I just can't do it. So I'm like, if somebody's going to go, would it be like a Carl Frank or Jerry? Possibly. <laughs> did they just, did they kill Jerry off? Imagine if they killed Jerry off. So if they kill Jerry off, that would be wild, but you would end up, that would affect Roman greatly because he obviously like does have some weird love for Jerry, like in his personal life, either as a mother or like a potential like romantic partner or whatever. It's like a weird, just a mix. You'd also open up the CEO spot again and they'd have to like, again, find a CEO, right? Between the three kids or Logan again, maybe after the investigation, it just would be so like wild. They're cleared. <laughs> or, or is it Ace Cars? Does he swoop in and become CEO? Oh. So this is my, these are my speculative thoughts, but I was like, maybe it's Jerry who actually does die. There's no, they're not, there's no reason to believe that other than just that anybody dies because this is not that show. It's not a show that yeah. kills people off. Or, you know, she could just be completely overselling it as well. Right. That's the other thing. It could be like a Paul Bettany when he was like, I had a great scene. But also that was like epic trolling because it was just himself. And yes. I respect that so much. And they should have given him the Emmy for that. <laughs> So. He should have won, but I'm just saying it could be something like that. It could be like a legitimate thing. It could just yeah. be her trying to like jump up, uh, you know, enthusiasm for the finale, which is in two weeks. But I don't know if somebody dies. I, I'm maybe, put, maybe it's I would, just like another waiter dying. Okay. I mean, it could be. Yeah, sure. They're at another like, wedding, so <laughs> it could also be uh, uh, Sandy with a Y because he's obviously in ill That's health. True. Yeah. In, in the show, Poss- possibly syphilis. The yeah, the MySpace of STDs. So incredible stuff i don't think it would be tom i don't think it'll be greg obviously it could be james i mean greg it could be james cromwell right uh, logan's brother that's another option i don't know i guess we'll have to see you if you know anything don't say anything but, i i don't know anything because they only sent eight so you think you think they'll send nine do you think they'll send the finale they they said they weren't going to so i don't, I don't think they will either yeah uh, it's, Joyce, it's we can like, talk yeah. about i mean well, I, so uh Succession's still good, as it turns out. And I, I, yeah. I checked, it's not eligible for Best Picture, unfortunately. So. I mean, we, we talked about this before. Why isn't it eligible for Best Picture? Uh, it's it's right, a nine-hour so. movie. It's so good. All right, Joyce, <laughs> see you next time. Bye. Bye.